The Paul Leslie Interviews. Our special guest, Mr. Keith Sykes, is a singer, songwriter, guitarist, and producer. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. It's an honor. I hope you can tell us a little bit about your background. Can you start with telling us a little bit about your parents? It all started in a small womb in Kentucky. <laughs> After that, it's just whatever happened with it. <laughs> Sorry, man. I couldn't resist. <laughs> No, I was born in Kentucky, and I lived there till I was almost nine years old, about a month and a half from being nine, nine years old. And I lived in Memphis till I was uh, graduated high school, and I moved away eight years. I was here intermittently in those eight years, but I was my residence was primarily in New York City. And, and then I moved back in 1974, which puts me in Memphis all the way till 2001. And then we moved over to uh, Fayette County, Tennessee, which no one knows where that is, so we just still say Memphis. What do you like about Memphis or that area? It's, you know, when I first started thinking about moving out of New York City, I was actually on my way to Los Angeles. But I'd been in Key West, and I drove up to Nashville, and I spent about a week up there, and uh, my buddy Guy Clark sent me around to his publisher, and I just didn't get any interest there. I didn't get any feeling like I was connecting musically with what they wanted, you know. I didn't uh, consider myself a country songwriter per se. So I just, even though I should have probably, I just didn't have it together that good. But I, I stopped off in Memphis to see an old buddy of mine. And we went out one, at, one night and I saw this girl across the room really beautiful girl that I knew from high school. I really didn't know her. I just used to see her from afar. And I went and told her that I had a crush on her, you know, since I was in the fourth grade, which was true. And she bought it, and we've been together ever since. And she lives in Memphis, so if I wanted to live with her, I'd better be Memphis. That was the main reason I stayed. But music has, uh, at the time, was still a music center with businesses still here, very viable businesses, you know publishing companies, record companies, so forth. And so it, was, it wasn't like I was out of the loop. But as the years went on, the business left Memphis. And I just stayed because I had established myself here and I could draw and make a pretty good living. And I was still able to, uh, because of my life that I had in New York City and, and the people I'd met in the music business just all over the country, you know, because you meet everybody in New York. And I, and I traveled for, you know, years and years all over the country playing colleges and uh, and clubs and so forth and doing shows. And I just uh, felt comfortable being here, and that's why I stayed. And, you know, I, and I had an offer to go with MCA Music Publishing back in 1980 or 81 to move to Nashville, and I didn't take it because I had my own publishing at that time, and I didn't think I would ever need anything else. In hindsight, that would probably have been a better idea for me. I could have had a lot of the songs that weren't, you know, country music has moved so far away from from where it was in 1970, in the early 70s. I probably could have done a pretty good, had a pretty good run up there in Nashville. But hey, man, I'm not looking back. I, I've enjoyed my life, and I'm still working on it. And uh, that's the way it is. Tell us about your parents. Were they musical people at all? No. Well, my mother played a little mandolin, but I never heard her do it. She just said when she was a little girl, she, she played mandolin with her sister who had a guitar. They had a little catalog, like Sears catalog or, Sears, or Montgomery Ward instruments. And uh, my sister, I think, has both a, the guitar and the mandolin now. But I never heard them play. And I, so I don't know if they were, I don't think they were ever, they were never professional musicians or anything like that. They were just just kids. Up, they lived way out in the country in, in Kentucky. And, and, well, Tennessee, actually, and uh, near a, uh, in, in, in an area, Stewart County, near Dover, Tennessee. That's when my mother and father were, were, were both born. They were, lived on the Tennessee River. Both, both sides of my family were from the Tennessee River. And when the T, T, TVA came in and dammed up, made the dams, their, both of their home places are now underwater. They've been underwater since, you know, the, the uh, late 40s, early 50s, whenever the dams started going in. And they moved, my mother and father moved to Murray, Kentucky, which is where I was born. They weren't musical people. My dad loved Hank Williams. And I do too. But, you know, just uh, they weren't in the business. 
You just mentioned Hank Williams. Tell us about some of the music that you appreciated most when you were growing up. Well, it's hard to say because, you know, back in those days, they, they was, it was called broadcasting. And where today it's called narrow casting. But when I was a kid growing up and on TV and whatever, you, you'd hear, just to use a few examples, like on the, on the radio, there would be a, a country song, there'd be a pop song, there'd be a novelty song, there'd be a song in a foreign language. There'd be an instrumental. There'd be all this stuff. I thought it's all in the same hour. Even up until, I guess, the very late 60s when FM radio came in and started playing, you know, maybe exclusively rock and roll or exclusively one thing or the other. Now, I'm not, I'm not counting classical music, which are th- th- those stations were always segregated amongst themselves. And, and the black radio, they kept segregated in the, in the most cruel way. But uh, musically, I'm just talking in terms of music. But... Anyway, uh, so I, I had so many different favorites, but the, my three, if, if a chair only has to have three legs, then each of my legs would be Hank Williams, Chuck Berry, and Bob Dylan. But that's really my greatest influences and, and some of the most joy I've ever had listening to records. It's been those three guys, and all for different reasons. You know? But I have loved so much music over my lifetime that it's impossible to just pin it down to any one thing. And, uh, of course, you know, Bob Dylan would would just be, if you just look at that one guy, you can go before his career and after his career. If you read about him, you'd know all the the old folkies that influenced him, the blues people, all that stuff. And then going forward, all the people, you know, Jerry Jeff Walker, Chris Christopherson, John Prine, all those kind of people that sort of came after Bob Dylan, the singer, the classic singer-songwriters, if you wanted to say that. But, you know, I, I mean, Chuck Berry was the same with rock and roll, all the, the R&B people that came before him, and he loved country music. I bet you anything, he bought a lot of records that were country western records, you know, Hank Williams probably, and Webb Pierce and those guys like that. But So it's just a real, with me, it's impossible to, to put, to get it down to just a, a person or two. <laughs> I just, even, I wouldn't even do it. <laughs> Well, I think it's kind of interesting that, you know, if you listen to the recordings that you've made, you really can't pin it down to one genre. And you you picked three people there, a folk musician, a folk rock, I guess you could call Bob Dylan, one of the fathers of rock and roll, Chuck Berry, and then Hank Williams, country music. And I think all of those things show up in your music. Well, they really do because they're really all, I think, great music. And they, they're, they're, they're just... I mean, my parents are from the Tennessee River. It doesn't get much more country than that, you know. I mean, uh, it's just I just have it's in my DNA. There's no way around it. And so I just I mean, when I first heard a, you know, like a Jimmy Dean had a TV station when I was still living in Murray, Kentucky, and he'd have different people on it, you know. And I just I just felt like I was a part of it for some mysterious reason. And I don't know. So there's just something going on inside of me that. This just always been there, you know. It probably was there before I was born. But anyway, that's that's my early uh, my earliest things of you know inspirations from music. And I mean, I remember going to the record store and buying a theme from Exodus, <laughs> you know, that movie, just because I love, and it made me love Ferrante and Teicher. And you might not ever know that by listening to my music, but honestly, uh, the very first uh, 45 I ever bought was Green Onions by Booker T and MGs. I didn't even know they were from Memphis. It didn't matter to me. I just loved that sound. I just thought it was really, really cool. And Buddy Holly, when I heard Peggy Sue, and there's a word for guys like him back then, and, and that when I saw him, he didn't look like one, but his music just sounded like he was a hood, you know? <laughs> I don't know if you're old enough to remember that expression for people who were kind of like leather jackets with the collar up and the duck tail, you know, haircut and stuff. It kind of hood, you know, hoodie looking guys maybe have a tattoo or something. Back when tattoos weren't art, they were just either, you know, jailhouse tattoos or something you got after midnight when you were drunk, when you were near a Navy base or something. I have heard the term, but I was born in the 80s. (laughs) Okay, man. (laughs) I'm talking to a mere child, which is fantastic. (laughs) Something that would be of special interest to our listeners, one of the places our show is broadcast is in Charleston, South Carolina. Yeah. Your performing career kind of began there. It did. My my actual professional career, I'd had a few little gigs, well, one or two maybe, 
Well, one gig at the same, you know, a couple of gigs at the same place for five bucks a night, and I played Bob Dylan songs all night, and which was good. I met a guy. He said, "Hey, man," even in the nicest possible way. He said, "Well, you should try some other kinds of songs." <laughs> Oh, really? <laughs> there are other songs besides Bob Dylan songs. <laughs> but anyway, I, I auditioned. Uh, I was, that was still during my hitchhiking days, and I hitchhiked up to the Newport Folk Festival, and I saw Arlo Guthrie in a workshop, and he played uh, Alice's Restaurant and completely blew my mind. And the record came out that fall, just not long. That was in August, so I guess September I, or October I bought that record. I saw it, cause I, and I learned the whole thing. And I auditioned over at Phillips Recording Studio and played the whole damn thing, and that's how I got on the Holiday Inn circuit. The first place they sent me was Charleston. I was there, I was there for two weeks, and it was like my first, like, man, I like, I like, <laughs> I like this. You know, I got my room, I got my transportation, I got my board, I got everything, and I got to play, and they gave me 150 bucks at the end of the week, and I'm going, I like show business. This is good. What are your recollections of Charleston during that time? Well, just the town itself. I met a lot of neat people. One guy took me over to Fort Sumter, and uh, we walked around over there. I think I might have picked up some little artifact, uh, a rock or a, a rusty nail or something, you know. But it wasn't like even a museum or anything. It was just a building over there they hadn't done anything with. At least that's my remembrance of it, and maybe I'm wrong. But now I'm sure it's all fixed up in the National Park, as it should be. But I remember going to right downtown, there's these old graveyards, and the grave, grave stones were really old, you know, like the seven, early 1700s and stuff. I mean, that town is really old, and I enjoyed things like that. I've always enjoyed history. That's what I remember about Charleston. I don't remember so much the ocean, because I didn't have a car. And I, everywhere I went was just walking, so if it wasn't within a few blocks, I didn't go anywhere, but... I met a guy, I think he was in the Navy, and he had an apartment downtown, and he played, we, he played me my, my first records that I heard of Frank Zappa, and it was his second album had come out, and I remember just laughing all the way through that thing. I, I don't know what I thought Frank Zappa was. I guess I thought it was some sort of heavy, hard rock or something like that, but I heard, I heard these great songs, man, it blew my mind, and they were just so, they really were inventive, they were the mothers of invention. But anyway, um, that's what I remember about Charleston. I met, I met guys I talked to, uh, well, a television guy I met. He was a, a news guy or weather guy or something. I, I forget what he was. Nice-looking man. He'd come down at night and, and watch me play my, my shows. And I mean, I, it had to be horrible because I just wasn't any good back then. I didn't know what I was doing. But it gave me a chance to kind of pick up and listen and watch other people. And one morning I was sitting in the restaurant having my breakfast. Porter Wagner walked in, and, uh, you know, two or three minutes later, five minutes later, Dolly Parton walked in, and he was kind of dressed up still like a star, but not, not really, really flashy, but you could tell it was Porter Wagner. But Dolly Parton, man, she didn't have on all the big dresses like they wore back in them. She just had on like a, a banana yellow Oxford cloth shirt, which I will never forget, and some jeans. And, I mean, she was just so pretty that you couldn't possibly believe it. You know, it was just fantastic. And I didn't know not to go over and pass them, but after I finished my meal, I just walked over and said, hey, uh, <laughs> I don't know what I said. I was probably so starstruck, but I shouldn't have. They were eating, you know, and that's just something you don't do. But I didn't even know not to do that. I was so green. We're talking with Keith Sykes, singer, songwriter, guitarist, performer. You decided to go on to New York. Was that your first time in New York City? Actually, uh, when I decided to go up there, to further my career or do some, try to get going in New York City. I'd, I'd, I'd hitchhiked up the year I graduated. I hitchhiked up in 1966, which is the year I graduated high school. And I'd been to uh, Washington, D.C., and I spent a week there and walked around the places and just did things I'd always wanted to do. And when I was in high school, you know, the things you see about the White House, Arlington Cemetery, Smithsonian Institute, all that stuff, and I went to those things. Then I hitchhiked up to New York, and I was there for a week, and I knew that I, mean, I wasn't ready. <laughs> Much as I would like to have been there and met some people, I just didn't have it ready. First of all, I had such small amount of money. I think it cost like five or four or something dollars a day to spend in that, like this place. It was just, I think it was the Earl Hotel down in the village, and I just wasn't ready. I remember I'd walk around during the day, go back and try to write something, and I think I did... 
I can't remember. I may have started writing a very short time at that time, but it, I doubt it. I, it may have been another year after that. But that's the first time I went. When I really went for real, I'd been working at the Holiday Inn in Buffalo, New York, going out on the road there to uh, Niagara Falls. So it was booked all summer long, solid 100%. They had no, they had no vacancy for all those months. So they put me in a little mom and pop hotel, motel across the street, and I played over there every night. And I met, a guy came in one night who I met. His name was Mark Goldfarb, and he was a bass player. And we'd take me to his house, and we'd listen to bluegrass. He was into bluegrass and blues, so we'd listen to a lot of that stuff. He told me about the coffee house circuit in New York City. And so uh, we flew over there and, uh, and auditioned for this thing and actually got on it. And uh, that's, um, that's how I got started in New York City. I moved up there. I guess it was August. I'd gone over there and got on the coffee house circuit, come back to, I had an apartment in Memphis at that time because I was basing out of Memphis, got my stuff, put it on my backpack and got my guitar and started hitchhiking over to uh, meet Jerry Jeff Walker in uh, North Carolina at that big army base town. I forget the name of it. You, you'd, you'd know it if I could remember it, but it's a big army base town in North Carolina. I met him and that's when I, the night I met David Bromberg. They were playing. And I took a plane up with them to uh, New York City, and I, I stayed there five years. If you look at all the different places that you have lived or that you have kind of migrated to, there are so many artist places. Austin, Texas, um, of course, Key West, New York City. Has there been a place that you found the most prolific in terms of creating your work? Well, of course, Memphis would have to be in there because I, lived, you know, I was there 21 years. And uh, although the, the songs I wrote in Memphis, some of them were great, I thought. And some of them I just, I was just, you know, the folk music had gone. By the time I moved back to Memphis, I was trying to figure out what to do. And I, I wound up being like, you know, playing uh, small clubs, playing dances and stuff like that. So I wrote songs that I thought would work for that. But anyway, as far as being creative, I think Memphis is the most excellent place for that. And I also think New York City is in another way. And, uh, and Key West is great. I wrote a lot of songs in Key West back during the early 70s. But the last seven years, I spent a month in Port Aransas, Texas, writing songs. So that's seven times, seven months I've been there. And in New Orleans, I've been down in the French Quarter for two months. Back in 1999, I wrote songs down there for two months. So anywhere I go, it doesn't really ma matter so much where I am. It just matters that people, if I, if I don't know anybody, that's a key element right there, not really knowing hardly anybody, and just staying in that room five days a week riding and then go out on the weekends, and it's always nice if it's a real small town or if I have my car uh, still small, just enough to just drive around to. But Key West, you can walk. I, I was in a position where I could just walk down to the, Duval Street and be around crowds, and meet people and stuff like that. Man, that's kind of important to do on the weekends to get out and just recharge your batteries. Outside of that, to me, if I have a room that I like, <laughs> and, uh, you know, a kitchenette's good because you don't even have to go out to eat and just fix up a little bite to eat like I do at home. That's what matters to me. That Just, just so long as I'm able to spend a lot of enough, it seems like after two or three days of being in that zone, I really arrive at being able to put songs together. And sometimes the songs are still crap. I, I know that. But sometimes they're real pearls, and I can sing them for the rest of my life. And, of course, that's what you live for. If I can get three or four of those a year, hey, man, job, you know, mission accomplished. What brought you down to Key West, Florida in the first place? Well, the management company that used to manage me had a, had a little office down there, kind of an apartment. What, because they promoted shows in that area. And so I had an open door to just go down there and hang, and I did. The first time I went down, I, I was just hanging out, and I drove. I always wanted to go to Key West. Just There's some mysterious thing about Key West to me. And I drove down, and I drove around a little bit, just saw things, and drove back. So the next time I went, I called uh, Jerry Jeff, because he, he lived there for a couple of years, 69, 70, 71, around those at that time. And I, and he just had moved over to Austin. Maybe he lived there more than two years. I can't remember 
exactly. I'd have to really sit down and think about it. But anyway, I called him up, and he wasn't there, and his girlfriend told me where to go, and uh, wound up meeting Jimmy Buffett there, and we just sort of became instant friends, and I met all these people that he knew. Just on the second day I was there, we all went out. They, had, they were having a party and went out to a place called Woman Key, and they just had a great party, and I just met so many people, and so many of them are still my friends right to this day. Tom Corcoran and uh, Phil, uh, shoot, <laughs> I'm forgetting people's names because I'm trying to remember them. Uh, Dink Benjamin, Phil Tenney is who I was trying to remember his name, and his wife, and just all these people that I met, girls and guys, and I just fell in love with the place, and I've been going down there ever since as much as I possibly can. There are so many characters also that have intersected in your life. It was, gosh, it was 10 years ago, and I was interviewing Todd Snyder, and I asked him about you, and he said, well, you could write a book about the intersections of Keith Sykes. Jerry Jeff Walker, Jimmy Buffett, John Prine, the late Guy Clark, other songwriters like Roger Cook. Is there a person that you say has made the biggest impression on you? Well, I guess I'd have to say Jerry Jeff because he was the first guy. Like that time I, when I went over there that August to audition for the coffeehouse circuit after leaving Buffalo, and we got on that thing that night. We passed. It took two auditions. You had to audition to be on the audition. <laughs> we did that, and then it got to the audition. So we auditioned and we got that too. So uh, the next day we were. They had us up to their office, and they said, "Who do you like?" And I said, "Well, all summer long." Well, about half the summer long, it came out somewhere in the middle of the summer, at least when I started listening to it. It was on the jukebox at that, at that Holiday Inn where I was playing. I'd go over during the day just to hang out of boredom, just to just sort of go someplace. I'd go over there for a little bit sometimes and, and play uh, Mr. Bojangles on the jukebox by Jerry Jeff Walker. And I was just enamored with that song. I thought, boy, this is really well written and so recorded. I didn't even realize at that point that it had been recorded in Memphis at Phillips Recording Studio where I went to do my audition, you know to get on the coffee, to get on the Holiday Inn circuit. But as I say, Memphis was a real center for recording at that time, and um, Adco had sent him down with Tom Dowd, and they cut Mr. Bojangles the single. And to me, that's still the best representative of that song that I've ever heard. Of all the versions I've ever heard, that thing is just miles ahead of anything else or above anything else. But they asked me who I liked, and I said, oh, I like this guy, Jerry Jeff Walker. And an hour later, Jerry Jeff Walker comes walking through the door because they wanted to impress me, and uh, and they happened, just happened out of the blue. They managed Jerry Jeff Walker. So they called him up and said, well, here comes Jerry Jeff. <laughs> and so we left that meeting. I'm there with Jerry Jeff Walker, and I'm just like, I didn't know what to think, you know. And they said, well, we'll go get some drinks. And yeah, sure, that sounds good. And he said, just stay at my place. And so I stayed at his place. And uh, then I, you know, had to go out on the coffee house circuit. But that's, that, that house, that apartment he had over at uh, 2nd Avenue and 6th Street. No, uh, 6th Street and 2nd Avenue. I think that's what it was. Uh, shoot, I've known that all my life. I forgot it right now, but I hadn't thought about it so long. But anyway, uh, I met, you know, that's where I met Gary White and Paul Siebel and... Uh, Towns Van Zandt, Frommux, which was uh, Steve Fromholz and his partner, Dan. I can't remember Dan's last name. I met so, so many people there. And at the Bitter End Coffee House, which they, uh, they either co-owned. Yeah, the management company used to be uh, Fred Weintraub's company. And Fred Weintraub and Paul Colby owned the Bitter End. So I, I could go to the Bitter End all I wanted to. And they didn't charge me or anything because I was one of the artists. And so I met all these people there. So I met Linda Ronstadt. I met Christopher. Well, Christopherson I met in a different way. But uh, John Prine, Steve Goodman, just on, you know, Loudon Wainwright. Every, all these people on and on and on and on. Just because we all were based in the village and hung out and we knew who was doing what, you know. What about the most interesting character from your life? Musician or not, who would you say it is? a good question, but I, I don't know if I can tell you who the most interesting character is, but I probably will at four o'clock this morning. I go, okay, I got it. 
But just start right now. I have no idea because I've met so many interesting people, so many talented people, and you know, just such great artists. Some of them I just have met, and they would never know me. I don't really know them, but but some of them I've actually got to know, and and I know I've known and do know some of the world's greatest artists, and that's just a really cool cool thing to have done. I wouldn't have done it if I didn't have, get that finish high school. I hated school. I wanted. I couldn't wait to get out of there. And so the, the, the day after I graduated, my mom dropped me off on, on the expressway <laughs> by a mile. She said, have fun. <laughs> and I did. I tried. So I'm still working on it. So she was completely supportive of you going off like that. Yeah, she was a single mom. She tried to be mom and dad, you know, and uh, bless her heart. Uh, and when I was finished the uh, 10th grade and going to the 11th, I asked, I asked her if I could hitchhike up to see my dad up in Kentucky, and she said, okay, that's fine. Because people hitchhike back then. You know, kids, that's how they got around. And she let me do that, and I stayed up there for a few weeks and hitchhiked back down and hitchhiked up there a few times. And then the next year, I was going to, after my 11th grade, I asked her if I could go down to Florida. And she said, okay, just, you know, got to be careful. So me and a buddy of mine hitchhiked down there to Florida and uh, spent the summer down there, just hanging out in Panama City Beach. And then I came back, hitchhiked back, went to school, finally finished the 12th grade and got out of there. And then I just left. And even though I, I, I was gone I had to come through Memphis to do this and that because it's geographically situated in, you know, the middle of things. And so I wound up coming to Memphis and I'd stay a few days to see my mom. And I'd always want to see her on, you know, on the holidays, the big ones, especially Thanksgiving and Christmas, you know. And so I'd be back here and I'd visit with friends and be around. And like I, and I said, uh, at one point I went ahead and got, after I got on the, the holiday end circuit, I got a, I got a little apartment in Midtown Memphis. And lived there for a little bit until I got the thing in New York City. But I was in and out of town all the time. I wasn't there that much in that apartment. But when I did, I I was just a young guy doing my thing, trying to learn how to be a singer-songwriter. I was hoping you could tell us about meeting Jimmy Buffett for the first time. What was oh. your first impression of him? Well, he seemed like a not a not a singer-songwriter. He seemed more like an athlete or something, kind of a jock or something. You know what I'm saying? He was just, hmm. he was just, he knew everybody down in Key West. I mean, he was staying at the house where Jerry Jeff's girlfriend Murphy told me to go. And so, but he, he was so like, you know, I, we, I was kind of like, uh, in New York City, I didn't even get up to noon. And I didn't go to bed till four in the morning. Just about every day I was there. And admittedly, I was, I'm, I was on the road a whole lot. In that time, but when I went home, that was my my cycle, and I had a lot of times off in the summer because most of the colleges weren't doing the coffee house thing during the summer months. That was just during the traditional September through you know May. But to know some, they were getting up at eight, and the, they were not getting up at. They were going to be, meet at the chart room bar at eight a.m. Six boatloads of people <laughs> to go out to Man Key and have this party, and, and I just kept thinking to myself. Is, is this a singer-songwriter? <laughs> Could he possibly be any good and get up at 8 a.m.? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. It just it just seems so against it's, 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 you know, cast against type, you know. But uh, as I got to know Jimmy, and he's such a genuine person, and we kind of knew of each other because I'd been on a tour with Jerry Jeff, and Jerry Jeff told me about Jimmy. And when he was touring with Jimmy, he told Jimmy about me. So we sort of knew of each other but through Jerry Jeff. So we just hit it off. I would go down there. If he was on the road, I could stay at his apartment. If, I, if When he came back, I had to go stay someplace else because it wasn't a very big apartment. He, 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 needed some time. he needed some space like we all do, you know. But I mean, we had that kind of relationship, and it stayed like that. And he came to Memphis to play the Ellis Auditorium. And it was a 5,000-seat place on Tuesday or something like that, completely sold out. And I kept thinking, man, Jimmy's at the big time here. I gave him, we changed the albums. He gave me a copy of Changes, and I gave him the way that I feel. My album had Costa Marseille and Last Line on it. And I'd be damned if he didn't call me up a little, you know, 
a year or so later and said, I'm going to cut your songs. He cut two songs on uh, Son of a Son of a Sailor. And then not long after that, he called me up when I was up in New York City uh, with Christopherson and Rita as a friend, not in a band or anything, but just as a, as a friend. He just invited my wife and me to come up and hang out. We were at the Waldorf. And he called up and said, do you want to be in the band? I mean, those are mind-blowing things, things that just don't happen to people every day. But it was stuff like that was happen, happen to me, happening to me all the time back then, and it was really cool. You mentioned just a moment ago your song, The Last Line. I've always liked that song. It's, it's a really interesting song. You can almost imagine an artist singing that song at the last concert of their career. <laughs> you know? Could you yeah. tell us about that song? What inspired it? Well, you know, music has so many peaks and valleys. It, it takes a lot of getting used to. It takes special people to stay in it. Most most people honestly don't. They'll come along and have some success, and the minute they're not making how much ever money they think they need to get along, they they go on to something else. And I just that just never uh, crossed my mind. But what did cross my mind was. Uh, just the, the this sort of nature of not just music, but just anything of uh, people just getting to a point where they say, you know what, I'm just going to step back from this and collect myself and I'll be back and see you, you know, tomorrow or whatever the day would be. And that's why I wrote this song. And it's the last song on my album. I just thought it was a nice way to end the album. That album is never a big seller, but the fans of that record are usually people who are really cool people like uh, Rodney Crowell. I can't think of a bigger fan of that record than he is. And he's, he's, he's you know, produced and recorded and written all these smash hits and done everything, but he still goes back to that record as an inspiration for him, and it always blows my mind that he does that because, I mean, to me, there's, there's not a better writer out there or a recording artist, really. I mean, his records, every one of them are just, they're impeccable, you know? And he was younger than me when he was doing all that stuff. But he had that feel. He had something that hardly anybody else has. But the one thing he had was a real love for that record. And I'm so glad he did, man, because it's, it's kept us together for a long, long time. And what about the song, Coast of Marseille? What was the inspiration there? Well, uh, I used to go to, about every six weeks, I'd go play two weeks in Mobile back in the mid-'70s. We play uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, Monday, Tuesday off. Or maybe I've got that wrong. Maybe just play Thursday, Friday, Saturday. We have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday off. Anyway, something like that. We, we was, it was easier to stay down there than it was to drive all the way back and come back again. And during one of those off days, I was out on the bay and uh, had my guitar, and I just started playing those chords. I've always loved it. That second chord in there, I've got it. I got it off a of Burl Ives record. Played that chord, and I always wondered what you know. So I, I, I always wondered how could I use that chord. And uh, so I played that E, and I played that next chord. I always thought it was a diminished chord, because I probably saw it out in a songbook. But you know those apps you get for your guitar that shows you chords. I've looked it up, and they don't call it that. They call it something else. So I guess I had that wrong. But anyway that chord, and then to the six minor, and then down to using the five with a minor. That's just all unusual stuff, and especially unusual for me. And it just it just haunted me. I just loved it, you know. And so, fast forward several months, and it was Thanksgiving, and hungover, and going in and out of the kitchen. Everything smelled so good to eat, nothing was ready yet. And my wife she said, get out of here. And on the 10th time, she said, well, we're just going to sit down and write a song. It's going to be a while before everything's ready. So I sat down, I had that music, and I wrote the words to the coast of Marseille. And I always liked the sound of the word Marseille. I had a, a buddy of mine up in New York City, Country Joe McDonald. You know, he, did, he was in The Fish, Country Joe and The Fish. When he went solo, he was doing an album. He was on Vanguard Records, too. So they asked me if I wanted to go by and hang out with Joe. I said, yeah, sure, it'd be great. And he played me the song he wrote, and he had the word. He had the city Marseille in there. It was about a drug song or something. I didn't. I didn't know to put it together that Mar Marseille was a big drug capital or any other capital. I just thought it just sounded good. So the thing that popped in my head was I sat there on the coast of Marseille, and I finished it, and I thought I had something pretty good, and uh, showed it to Jerrine. She liked it, 
I thought, damn it, is Marseille on the coast? <laughs> <laughs> so I looked it up, and it was on the coast. I said, hot damn, I did it, you know. And uh, it just struck a chord with a lot of people. And I can't tell you the amount of people that have come up to me after shows or, did you, know, did you write Coast of Marseille? And that's just such a beautiful song. And Buffett always used to say, Keith Sykes wrote the song in a brief moment of sanity. <laughs> and maybe I did, but or maybe I didn't. I don't know. But I was lucky to write that one. I'm glad, I'm, I'm glad you like it, too. There are so many recording artists that have recorded a Keith Sykes song, a song that you wrote. We could list them. Jimmy Buffett, Jerry Jeff Walker, the boogie-woogie pianist Marsha Ball, yeah. Rodney Crowell, the French singer Johnny Holiday, Rosanna Cash. Who has recorded the Keith Sykes song that you think is the best interpretation of something that you wrote? Hmm. I thought... Take Me, Take Me, that Roseanne Cash did really, really good. Because, I mean, I had a little demo of it, but she made it be like a real record, you know. And then, of course, Volcano, I didn't write that by myself, but I'm sure I'm glad that that record came out, I mean, came together so uniquely. And it just sort of just, to me, it just painted such a great picture of where we were and the whole feel about it. Everything. I don't know how that could get any better. You know, I mean, I just don't. The original recording of that song. What about the songs that you recorded yourself? Oh, well, let me see. I think uh, songs or recordings, because there is a difference, you know. I mean, you can write a song and it not sound very good, but a recording can make, you know, a song come to life. Just a, a song that you wrote in that case, yeah. The, a song okay. that you wrote, one that you feel maybe best defines you. Well, that's that's a tough one, you know, because uh, I don't, I, you know, I'm 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 much better at letting other people say that than than me, because I mean I have no idea. I I've, I like songs for different things. I hear things no one else will ever hear. I understand that as an artist, you know, I'm going to hear something so tiny no one would ever even notice it and it just bugs me to pieces or I hear something else that I just love that no one will ever notice and uh, so I'm just not a good good person on that but I, I guess I would have to think I think Love to Ride uh, turned out pretty good and a lot of people have recorded that and done that over the years it's, it's a bluesy kind of song and you know not a lot to it but it's just got a good feel one night I, uh, I got to I was asked to come up and play with B.B. King or sit in with him, and I played that one, and B.B. King liked it. So, I mean, what else can you... <laughs> how far can you go, you know what I mean? <laughs> B.B. King liked my song, so screw y'all. <laughs> uh, but uh, anyway, I, I'm sorry. Uh, I just can't... Uh, I can't put my finger on that one right now. But, I mean, I have made some pretty good records, I believe. All of them, I think, could be better. I'm, I'm uh, working on the discography of the albums I've done, if not the songs I've had recorded, but I'm starting with just the albums I've done from my website now. And I'm up to my uh, seventh or eighth one. It's called It's About Time. And I've played it for the first time in a long time, and I was surprised that that thing's got some pretty good stuff on there, especially the songs. But still, I'm, I'm not the person to ask for that. What is the biggest compliment you've ever gotten? Well, I don't know. I guess, you know, if when, when people say they heard the song on the radio, heard a song on the radio, and they were just blown away by it or stuff like that. Uh, I don't know if it's big or small, but when somebody like Christopher, the first time I met Christopher, I didn't know who he was. I was sitting in this little place called a Kettle of Fish up in New York City having dinner by myself. And this guy walks over to me and looks down and says, hey, man, are you Keith Sykes? I said, yeah. And he says, well, I love your album, man. I had one album out at the time. And he said, I think it's great. And I just thought, that at that point, it didn't affect me so much. But as I got to know Chris and heard his stuff, you got to take that as a pretty much of a compliment. Or the guy who writes, you know, uh, all, you know, like Buffett. When Buffett does a song, that, that's pretty complimentary, you know. And Jerry Jeff's done like six or seven songs. Rodney Crowell's done six songs. I mean, that's, 
you don't get a, much of a bigger compliment than that. I mean, Roseanne Cash has recorded four of my songs. I don't think anybody else can say that except for Roseanne Cash. That is quite a compliment. That's pretty complimentary. I'm going to pour me some water. Hold on just a sec. Yeah, no problem. Just in case someone's looking this, someone's listening that's looking for, for if you're trying to find uh, sparkling water or soda, as it's called, you know. Oh, so I can make some that doesn't have sodium. <laughs> I just wanted you to know. Because <laughs> the stuff you usually get has got sodium all loaded in it. Like club soda has got just tons of it. And even, But uh, Osaka doesn't have any. It's got, And it proudly states it's got two ingredients, water and, and gas. Now that's, that's really good. Not bad. When someone listens to your music, whether you're performing it, or they're listening to a recording, what do you want them to get out of that experience? Enjoyment. You know, if they're listening to, like, for an example, a song I wrote called Broken Homes, it's not a sad song. It's actually a joyful song, but it makes a lot of people cry. And they come up to me after the show and say, oh, God, you played that song and I cried. And I thought, good, because <laughs> I knew they weren't crying like sad tears. It's just like a... a Kind of a profound thought, you know. Broken homes don't have to make little broken girls and boys. And, you know, people hear that coming out of the song, and they go, wow, they're kind of blown over by it, you know. That's always great. I always like to do that myself. When I get a song that gives me chills or just moves me to the point, first of all, it's got to move me to the point I go buy it. And then when I'm listening to it, I just, you know, I just, I just love it, and I'll wear it out. And uh, I still love that. That's one of my favorite things to do in life is to hear a song the first time that just blows me away. And, it, and if, it, if it does that, whether it's a singer-songwriter playing by himself up there in a lonesome bar with two people out there, or it's on the radio station, and it's a hit already, but I hadn't heard it. If, you know, if, it, 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 I just love that. And that's uh, why I can't understand people who don't like to go hear original music. Because... You know, sure, some of the stuff you're going to hear is not going to be any good. I heard some Beatles songs I didn't think were very good. But that's just, you know, it's just the exception and not the rule. A lot of times you're going to hear these songs that just stay with you the rest of your life. It seems like in a lot of ways your life has been about the relationships you've had with people. It's not many people who are able to stay in touch. You've had these friendships that have lasted your whole life, and then you have your relationship with, as you mentioned, your wife. What is the secret to that? How do you, how do you do that? Hmm. Well, I don't know. I mean, uh, first of all, try not to piss anybody off, I guess. Uh, but mainly, I think if you're yourself, people know that. At least I feel like if somebody's, if I'm with somebody who's rich and famous or whatever, or famous or rich, whatever, and all they talk about is them. That's good for a little bit, but after a while, I just it's it's just it's just not my style, you know. But if I'm with someone like that and and we talk about everything, you know, we might talk about I might ask about some song or whatever someone's done, but you know, if they talk about fishing or girls or airplanes or whatever, you know, cars and houses. And, just whatever, just life, just tell jokes or whatever. That always makes me feel good. I know a fellow named Roger Cook. He, well, you mentioned Roger a little earlier. A oh, fantastic songwriter. A great, great worldwide success since 1965. I mean, he's just been putting them out there. And we don't get together, and he doesn't tell me, oh, I was with Paul one time and we did this or something like that, talking about McCartney or... You know, I sang on the first three or four Elton John records and all that kind of stuff. You know, he, he, he's done a million of those things. It, 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 you, you don't know it because he ain't going to tell you. And it doesn't matter to me so much. I mean, because I'm with a cool cat. I don't care, you know. I mean, I care. It's interesting. I want to know all about him, but it's not something he just puts up in your face. But people who do that, I have a tendency to not to hang out with as much as people who don't do that. I don't know. I guess, that's, I guess that's part of it. As far as me and my wife, I have no idea how we made it this far. Outside of being just dead bum, dead in love. You know. <laughs> I may not like her all the time. I know she don't like me all the time, but we're in love. You know. mm -hmm. and, uh, 
Well, I should just say we love each other, and and because we've just done so many things together, and she's my soulmate and all that sort of stuff. What is the best thing about being Keith Sykes? Well, let's see. Uh, the best is uh, I am. I work for myself, and I work hard. I, I work every day on trying to make something happen, a song become famous, or write a good song, or play it right, or something like that. But, I mean, I can get up in the morning and take my walk and shower up and get ready for the day, come down, fix breakfast, read the first section of the newspaper, and not have to really... I mean, that's pretty great, you know. If I wake up at 7, that's good. If I don't wake up till 8.30, that's good. That's, that's pretty good. A lot of people would really like to have that job. And uh, I'd say that's, that's pretty good about it. But uh, I think even better than that is, like you just mentioned a, few, a little bit ago, uh, you asked me like about friends I've been able to have over a long period of time. That's the essence of it. That and your health. I mean, if you don't have health, you don't have anything. I've been blessed with reasonably good health. Knock on wood, I'm doing that now on the top of my head. And having good friends who care about you. That's, uh, that's a good life right there. This is a very open-ended question. For anyone who's listening into this, what would you say to them? Anything at all? Hello. <laughs> I guess, <laughs> man, I don't know. <laughs> it depends, you know, but I'd just say hello or something. Maybe nothing. I don't know if they didn't want me to. My last question. Okay. Who is Keith Sykes? Keith Sykes. He's a singer-songwriter who really tries to do good work. Well put. Thank you, man. Well, thank you so much for sharing with all of us. Well, I really appreciate you uh, you having me on your show. I hope I hope you all all the success in the world. Well, thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Have a good one. You too. All right. Bye.